Hello, and thank you for joining us for this edition of Central Georgia Focus, the Ask Mayor Miller June edition. As always, we sit down each month with Macon Bibb County Mayor Lester Miller and ask questions on your behalf and on behalf of the Center for Collaborative Journalism. Welcome, Mr. Mayor. It's good to have you back again. It's good to be here. Now, since our last Ask Mayor Miller, you presented your nearly $204 million budget to the County Commission, including that expected five mil property tax rollback. And our first set of questions comes from our friends at the Macon Telegraph. Can you explain how the other local option sales tax has affected the millage rate? And are there any other rate or fee increases or changes in the budget? Well, the, uh, the OVOS that people supported 80 to 20, 80 percent to 20 percent on a referendum uh, is making a substantial decrease in property taxes. Uh, so far, we've seen a two mil decrease last year. We'll have a five mil, probably five mil plus this year. Uh, right now, last Friday, the tax assessor sent out the new assessments for this year. So probably in today or tomorrow, you'll receive your tax assessment uh, letting you know the millage rate reduction. So you'll get an additional five mils reduction in your property tax. And then once the tax digest is complete somewhere around August, uh, we'll look back at that again to see what kind of growth we had from last year to see if we would roll a millage rate back even more. So uh, all taxpayers should receive on their property a, a pretty substantial reduction this year. And of course, next year we go to 100%. So we expect another reduction next year. So all in told, you're looking at somewhere between 40 and 50% reduction in millage rate in the last four years. Of course, property owners have 45 days to appeal those assessed values that your <laughs> express you know self doesn't have anything to do with it's the tax assessors so can you explain that process a little bit and do you think you know last year everybody took a hit because property values were so high do you have any feel for how those assessments are going this year i think you'll see a lot more leveling out now last year making bip county was in a uh countywide audit so uh it, it means every property typically they do about one third uh, of the properties per year but last year we were required, uh, mandated by law, to do the entire county. And, and of course, you know, as you can see, housing price, prices have gone through the roof over the last couple of years. So when your neighbor sells their property for twice what they bought it for, it's going to affect the value of your property as well. This year I wouldn't expect much of a bump, even though it, things are probably leveling out. There's still some increases, I suspect. Uh, Warner Robins, on the other hand, next door neighbors to us, they, they're going through a countywide audit, I believe, this year. They're already indicating about a 15, 20 percent uh, increase in theirs, and I don't think they're rolling the millage rate back. So every county is going to be different, but we're all still in the state of Georgia. We're all still in the United States, and uh, property values continue to climb. But certainly, even if your property is assessed more uh, and you file an appeal and you're not successful, your, your taxes are still going to be cheaper than last year because of the substantial rollback that we have. What is the most highly funded aspect of your budget or department, and why is that such a priority? Well, it's very easy, the public safety. Uh, public safety is one of those things that are continue to be a large part of our budget. Uh, I think some $87 million out of the uh, $204 million is public safety. Of that, I think about $55 million of that is just for the Sheriff's Department, uh, mostly, and maybe 911 alone. So I think that's gonna continue to be the norm. Uh, our budget in the last three years has increased about $12 million for public safety. Uh, because we said public safety is a top priority and we're going to continue to fund that so that's going to be one of those biggest increases that we have across the border every um, single department that we have may have went up slightly uh, as you may remember we made sure last year that we re we increased our minimum wage in Macon Bibb County to $15 uh, that's going to make every department that has employees that were making less than that amount get bumped up and then a few of those people above them because of compression receive some uh, raises as well. So you'll, you'll see those things go up a little bit and of course just the cost of doing business goes up. So where are we with a county pay scale and will there be kind of like a salary database for county employees once the budget is passed? Well, they done a pay scale a couple of years ago. Uh, we funded a pay scale when we got here as far as what we consider a pay scale, a pay raise. Um, the What we tried to do is increase the uh, work at the bottom. We've increased those that we're making when I got here, some were making $11.50 an hour. All those people now make a minimum of $15. And we've been slowly moving the people up above them to make sure that you're in line with what we call compression. And of course, we did the incentive plan for all the uh, public safety officials. So that's pretty much taking care of any pay scale that we have there. But uh, right now, we're, we're, you know, we, we don't know where we're going to go. I mean, we don't know what happened in, in the United States as far as this, uh, the debt situation that we have now, whether or not we're going to go into recession. So we're going to be very conservative this year with our finances to make sure that we are protective of the taxpayers' dollars and be able to use that most efficiently. 
And do you have any special projects in this budget, anything unique or interesting that you'd like to expound upon? Well, uh, everything's special in our budget. <laughs> we, we continue to uh, make sure that um, we're taking care of the blight in our community. You know, people have talked about that. Uh, recreation, human resources, those types of things. Uh, human services are, are being funded. Um, we're going to continue to fund uh, pedestrian safety. Uh, that's one of the issues that we put another $500,000 back in the budget. Uh, our beautification continues to, to grow and improve on that. And of course, the roads this year, we, we've mentioned that we're going to fund five times uh, as much money as we previously did in the roads, and we expect those things to start dropping. We have an RFP out there now for people that are qualified to do potholes and things of that nature. So we get a lot of calls on potholes you in the do. government. And uh, of course, you know, those quick fixes don't always work out, but we have to get out there right away and do something that makes it a little challenging. But we're going to keep funding all those things that people have asked for. And uh, we're going to do it at a substantial level, but at the same time, we're going to make sure that we, uh, you know, we save for a rainy day. And speaking of that, do we have a rainy day fund for Macon Bibb County? How much is in it and when would you tap into it? Well, hopefully we'll never have to tap into it. That means we've got some issues there. I noticed recently that the school system's having to balance their budget with about $18 million between their, uh, their SPLOST and their general fund. That's a situation I don't want to be in with the county. Right now, we, we increased. I think we have about a 60 to 80 days in our, our reserve right now. Uh, before, we only had about a 30 or sometimes less than that. But we, we changed our policy last year to increase the amount of money we have to have in our reserve, and we've got sufficient funds now for a rainy day if it happens. But right now, we, we want to plan for the worst and hope for the best, and I think we're in a very good financial situation. And you said with the threat of a possible recession, I guess a rainy day could be a whole rainy season, right? So you want to be conservative. Oh, very, very, so, very much so. We don't know what's going to happen, and, and we're expecting at some point in time uh, to have a recession or at least start coming out of a recession if we're in one now, because usually they're delayed. Uh, but we want to make sure that we're prepared for that. We don't want to overspend. We may come back and amend this budget, as we always do, about midway point, once we know how much money is coming in. I mentioned last time we were here that uh, the state of Georgia has already seen a decrease in their sales tax uh, for this year, but Macon Bibb County continues to grow. Uh, we're ahead of where we were last year, and that's a good sign for for the tourism and all the things that we're doing in our community. And of course, the budget hearing will be June 6th at five o'clock at City Hall. And then the county commission is expected to pass the budget June 20th, is that the process? Certainly we'll have a vote on the 20th. We hope that it passed. Uh, I think we've had some pretty good input from our commissioners. Uh, always there's gonna be some questions that we'll have to answer between now and then, but uh, with the community can be heard if they think that the, the five millage rate is something they don't want. <laughs> uh, of course, I don't expect anyone to, to contest that. Uh, and I think we continue to put the money where it's supposed to go. And then on the 20th, we'll take a vote and hopefully it'll pass at that time. All right. Well, you know, we've officially kicked off the summer season. So when we come back, we'll be talking about fun in the sun in Macon Bibb County. So stay tuned. Welcome back to Central Georgia Focus, the Ask Mayor Miller edition for June. Of course, we're into the summer season now, all kinds of fun in the sun, but we've also had another tragedy at the Amerson Water Park, and y'all have uh, put some extra safety measures in place, but there's been another apparent drowning. So what more do you think can be done to keep people safe out there on the river? I really don't know. I think that uh, we've done as much as we can do to make sure that people are, um, know what they're supposed to do. We require life jackets there. We've had life jackets available for anyone there for free uh, to use while they're there at the park. Uh, what a lot of people don't understand is once they get in that water, we don't have any control over it. Uh, they can get in, in the water in Juliet and go completely downstream without any kind of uh, interference with Macon Bibb County. Uh, they can actually literally get in the water with a life jacket on, meet our standards, and throw the life jacket back on the bank, and there's nothing we can do about it. So. All we can do is continue to educate folk, let them know, first of all, whether you can swim or not, you still need to have a life vest on. People that can swim uh, at a good pace still, still die. They still drown. Uh, but unfortunately, those that don't swim, that get out there and think the flotation device alone is going to save them, is not going to be the case. So uh, we, we're very saddened about any time this incident happened, uh, any loss of life, especially involving something uh, like drowning, uh, is something that's not acceptable. But we can only do what we can do. We can educate people. We, we got to have People have to have accountability for themselves, unfortunately. Uh, and the easy thing to do is wear a life vest. I mean, it can save your life, and that's hence the name. 
And there's a hidden danger kind of down there on the waters. There's a lot of kind of underbrush and things that people could get trapped under. It's not just the, you know, whether you can swim or not swim, you right. could also get into a very serious situation. And I think as more people are using the river, it just seems like there needs to be a greater awareness somehow, but I don't know how you do that. Signs are posted now, right? right? And warning people about Signs all of that. Signs are posted. The other problem you have is that some, you know, depending on the time of the year and how much rain we've had, um, you can get and walk, and maybe you're in three or four feet, and you're, you're comfortable, you're six feet tall, and you can walk through it, so you think it's all like that. Then you get in a section that may be 20 feet or 15, you know, so necessarily you can't touch bottom. And then you get some currents as well, and, you, and it kind of takes you under. Usually we have those situations where someone's walking on the rocks and they fall. Uh, this last particular situation, I think they were on an inner tube uh, and fell off the inner tube and couldn't swim. So, unfortunately, it's one of those things that we have to continue to kind of stress to get out there. But it's no fault of anyone. We still have to be accountable for our own actions. In recent years, y'all have struggled to have lifeguards in place. But recently, the county commission has contracted with a company, Aquatic Management Services, for $368,000 to hire and train and staff the lifeguards. So how are we with the county pools? I understand there's still issues with Bloomfield. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, in any, uh, any situation that you have, you're always going to have challenges when you have, um, you know, projects and in, in, in facilities that you have to maintain and upkeep. Uh, most of the pools this year are working. Uh, hopefully, Bloomfield to get back up as well. Uh, Bloomfield had some leaks, uh, some problems there with leaks, and they were working on doing that in the off season. Unbeknownst to Macon Bibb County, they had a, a pump that went out. It's not just like you can go to the store and buy a pump and fix all the leaks in a short period of time. So, as soon as we became available, uh, became noticed of it, uh, we began to work on that process. So, hopefully, we're going to do that. But even those folks there at Bloomfield, unfortunately, they don't have a place close by they can go to. They can schedule a ride and go to one of the other pools at free of charge uh, as far as the transportation. Our, our, uh, our staff is going to take care of those kids at those pools. They did so this last week. I think they can take up to 20 at a time. So we want to make sure they still have an opportunity. Uh, we want people to get out and enjoy the, the pools as much as possible. Not every part of our community has pools. Uh, I mean, there's not a recreation center in Lizella. Those kids don't have a pool uh, to go to there as far as Bibb County Recreation is concerned. But they still get through the summer each and every uh, year. So. Uh, something that really we, we're going to continue to work on every year that seems to be some type of an issue with the facilities. But when you go years and years and years, you don't have the maintenance that you should. It's hard playing catch up. In the last couple of years since we've arrived, we're playing catch up a lot in our facilities. And we're going to continue to try to get better. And when did you find out about that pump going out there at Bloomfield? I, I was only uh, made aware of it in the last few months. Um, and, and we immediately started looking at those things. You got to keep in mind, we've done a lot of work over at Gilly. It's been a lot of time, money over there. Uh, we've had some issues with vandalism over there and things that's been damaged as well. But, um, you know, we want kids to have a good time at the pool, but we also know that there's steps that you have to take to make sure it's safe. And, of course, at this time, you know, at the time we started looking at the pump, we didn't realize that we were going to have this lifeguard contract at the same time. So we're already challenging that issue there. But uh, we're going to continue to do what makes, you know, make it right for the people in that area there. And certainly we want them to know that we're working hard daily to try to, to, try to take care of those situations. But sometimes things break. And the environment that we have now with supply and demand, uh, we've got products that have been waiting on for a while uh, to come in, and, and sometimes it's just not there. Now, what is the status of the Sandy Beach Water Park, too? I know the company that has been running it has gone out of business, or at least at that site. What is the status? Uh, there's no status right now. Basically, we're, we're reevaluating uh, what it would cost to repair that. You know, the county inherited that by default. Uh, it wasn't like we went out and purchased that. It wasn't like it's a county started project. I know there's people on both sides of the spectrum. You know, people complain about why you have a water park out there, but the moment it breaks, everybody supposedly went there all the time. So uh, we're looking at some other things we can do out there. There's some other, um, I think, types of recreational activities that can go in that place, maybe maintain part of it. But quite honestly, if you, if you don't do things right and you don't know how to run a place like that, you shouldn't take on an operation. So unfortunately, the, uh, the previous owner there of the park couldn't make it work. The people that came in and leased it couldn't make it work. So right now we're kind of reevaluating to make sure we do what's right by the people. The last time we talked, you couldn't really elaborate much on your plans that you might have for Lake Tobosofki, but can you generally lay out your vision for that property that the county owns? <laughs> well, we, we still can't. There's a couple of parks that, uh, like Arrowhead, um, we're looking at uh, doing some improvements over there. We continue to kind of try to monitor that. Need some more sand over there, some more camping sites. Uh, there's another part in the back back there we're trying to determine what what use is going to do there we're going to continue to try to work on making sure the dam is taken care of and protective and clean up the uh the area there 
Uh, I, I think there's going to be some expansion there in the near future, but uh, that's something we have to look at once all of our splice projects are completed. So we'll take a look at that probably the end of next year to see what's going to happen there. You know, I, I can see a lot of things happening there, but right now we want to basically just kind of take a wait and see approach on there. Led me into the next question because floss collections are running ahead of schedule. I know you're probably already making a mental list, if not <laughs> one on your desk, 18 things maybe that you have um, that might come up for another SPLOSS proposal. So it, anything that you can share about what you might be thinking about at this point? Well, we're going to continue to, to do things like building fire stations uh, and things of that nature. At some point in time, the conversation is going to have to be had about uh, Sheriff's Department, whether they're going to build a new jail. Our convention center, center over at Central Place is getting out, outdated, in my opinion. Uh, roads uh, is going to be a big issue. I, I'm going to ask for probably some $40, 50000000 million in the next splice for roads, but I think we're, going to, we're making a good impact now on our normal plan. We're going to get those four and fives caught up. But we need to make a substantial statement. Uh, and so we're going to look at trying to put some significant funds uh, into a ROSE program if the people choose to do that. We're going to get an input. We're going to continue to do things like recreation and make sure that we maintain those facilities. Uh, and we're going to increase tourism as well. So those are just some things on my wish list. Uh, the whole entire commission and the, and the whole community at, at actually uh, will play a part in that. So we'll have some uh, conversations with them to see what they want. We are ahead of schedule. We do anticipate voting on a new SPLOS if we renew it in 2025. I see. All right, well, you're leading me into the next segment, too, because when we come back, we're going to talk about roads and transportation issues, so stay tuned. for staying with us for this Ask Mayor Miller edition of Central Georgia Focus. Now, Mayor, we were talking a little bit about roads at the end of the last block, but you know, we're marking the sixth year anniversary of the groundbreaking for the I-16, I-75 interchange project coming up later this month. So when do you see that project finishing? Well, that's a big question. <laughs> I'm not sure when it's gonna finish. I know that there's stages of it that'll be done in the next two years. So I expect around 2026, the majority will be done in what you generally call the interchange there. There's still some additional phases that go out uh, in both directions that'll probably continue to 2028. Uh, and then you'll start looking at Bass Road in that area and of course Forest Hill Road in that area as well. So there's other, other big projects in the work. But that's a 10-year that's a you know, project at the minimal from start to finish. Uh, and of course you have challenges like uh, rain and, and design changes and sometimes funding changes. So. Uh, Certainly everybody wants that out of the way. It's gonna be great when it is completed, but you know, you go to Atlanta every day and you think that when are they ever gonna finish it? They're just doing another project. So really you're never finished. It's always a constant uh, fluid situation, but I think you're gonna be very pleased with the finished project when it happens uh, in a couple of years. Well, that was John Filler's question. And now moving on to Amy Maley, you mentioned Forest Hill. She wants to know, is Forest Hill one of the roads that are set to be paved? Well, Forest Hill is one of those tricky situations where uh, a while back, it was decided that road was going to be widened. Uh, it does need to be paid, by the way, but it needs to be widened as well. And the state's been on again, off again with funding. Local, del local uh, commissioners really has shelved the project for a while. And recently, we tried to activate that project uh, itself. We put, our, we put our money aside. So it's something that needs to be widened. But if you remember back in the day, the reason they were widening that is because of the, the make and mall. Right. <laughs> Everybody going from one place to the other. And then after the mall kind of died out a little bit, uh, that project kind of sat on the shelf and now people want to see it paved again do you go out in there and spend several million dollars paving it just to have to tear it up and widen it the next year or two uh, that's kind of the thing that we're playing now there's some rough spots and i think need to be taken care of but we've got commissioner valerie Wynn and commissioner uh, mallory uh, jones and also uh, mayor pro tem clark that's pushing that through the through the process and they want to really see that widened done uh, and repave so hopefully that's going to happen and we'll get the money put back in there for that project in the next year. And Bobby Bale wanted to know about potholes on Bay Street and 7th Street and overgrown weeds and bushes in the right of way. Amy Maley also had a concern about that on Ayers Road. So I know that there's a process in place for getting these different areas fixed. Can you explain that a little bit? Well right now they can go to C-Click Fix and put that information in there and we'll get uh, a ticket back to them and uh, we'll get it taken care of on a temporary basis. Potholes are going to be a problem. You can think about this. Zero property tax dollars have gone to paving before. People always say, I pay my property taxes, but yeah, your property taxes has not been to go to uh, paving roads. 
A lot of people don't know that. It's been a few hundred thousand dollars of SPLOS dollars. The rest of it's been state funds uh, that, that have gone to that. And it's been a very small amount per, put aside each year. That's why we're increasing the amount that we fund about five times, including some property tax dollars, so we can make a bigger impact. And of course, we hope the SPLOS is gonna make a bigger impact on that as well. One thing we've got going on right now, I think for another couple of weeks, uh, we have an RFP out there or RFQ so we can qualify those businesses in Macon, Bibb County and around us that can do a better job of doing potholes. We know we're limited with the skill that we have and the equipment that we have. Uh, and also, you know, you have to get asphalt when it's ready. So we don't own an asphalt plant. So people say, why don't you go fix this and fix that? Well, sometimes we're at the mercy of the people we have to get the asphalt from. And then we have to go out there and do a quick repair that's not a really good prepare, you know, uh, repair that we have. So right now we got an RFP out there. We're going to qualify a bunch of folks, uh, put money in the budget, and that way when we need a good job done, there's a substantial area. They can go out there and cut part of the whole road and do a good and level job there instead of this little patching here and patching there. So I think you'll start seeing some improvements, not as soon as everybody would like for them to happen, including myself, but I think we're well on the way to uh, getting that, that problem taken care of. But it takes time. Uh, and now it's the time to do it, and we, we got the money to do it, so you're going to see some changes. And related to the interstate project, Cindy Collins asks, could you do something about the red light there at North Avenue and Kroger? Because the traffic getting onto I-16 kind of backs up and kind of covers coming out of Nottingham. She says that the traffic lights don't appear to be timed correctly. So how do y'all work with GDOT in a situation like that to make sure the traffic is flowing locally? Well, they test that all the time. And actually, Nigel Ford with our, our uh, traffic engineer does a lot of that as well. So they can contact them if there's an issue there. They go out there and time it on a regular basis and make those changes. But sometimes you just have too much traffic there. Uh, you have so much traffic to get it done. No matter how quickly you can get those things changed, uh, it, it really can't be done. So I would say reach out to our traffic engineer, Nigel Ford. Uh, have them do a, a, an engineer study on there to see if the timings work. Sometimes they have to, to change those a little bit. So it's something that we, we do on a regular basis. And of course, the QT quick trip is expected to go in there. There's taken a little bit of time, though. I'm not sure what the status of that project is. I know PNZ hasn't heard anything lately. I don't know if you have about what's going to happen with that whole like five points area there right across North Avenue and uh, where the Krispy Kreme is. I think they're trying to find an alternate location for that before that build out. Do you have any light to shed? Well, one thing, if you may, may know, that on Thomaston Road right there at 475, the Quick Trip is being built, uh, doing a very good job at it. I've seen a lot of work happen there on a regular basis. So typically, uh, once they get through with that, as they did the one on Riverside Drive, they moved on to the one on Thomaston Road. So as you see that project complete, they'll do the next one over there in the area we're talking about. They have a crew that does all their, their build outs. So they go from one project to the other. So I suspect as soon as they get that project done on Thomaston Road, they'll immediately run over there to uh, next to the Krispy Kreme by the new way uh, and accomplish that task as well. All right, one more quick question. Cherie Bell has some concerns about rooms for rent, like boarding houses. How can they be better monitored to avoid problems? We have about 30 seconds. Uh, well, basically that's a planning and zoning situation so they can contact planning and zoning about the, uh, the, the boarding houses. At the same time, you know, what kind of problems are they creating? Uh, if they're creating some crime problems, well, certainly they need to be addressed, but right now we're in a housing shortage. Uh, we're in a situation where there's no affordable housing that's on the market available right now, so people need a place to live. Would you rather live there in a boarding house shacked up? Uh, if it's a safe environment, would you rather be on the street or a street corner or perhaps under a bridge? So I would say contact planning and zoning. Uh, and some issues, if there's uh, challenges there at the residence, we sent our code enforcement out there, but when they go in there, they'll shut that house down or, or you know, declare it uh, unsafe or condemn it. And then of course you have eight or 10 people that's out on the street. So you really have to kind of balance these things out until you get better housing on the board. All right, well, thank you, Mayor Miller for your time. And as always, this is your program too. So send your questions to mercerccj at gmail.com and we'll see you again next month.